and I'm happy to welcome you to this event in our Humanitarian Affairs series on protecting civilians, distinct approaches, and complementarity of roles. IPI is pleased to be co-sponsoring this discussion with the International Committee of the Red Cross as it celebrates its 150 years of humanitarian action. <clears throat> The timing is also good for us here at IPI as we have recently inaugurated a new humanitarian affairs program under senior policy analyst Jeremy Labbe and a humanitarian affairs series of which today's meeting is a part. That series has offered a platform for, U for UN humanitarian coordinators and other senior humanitarian practitioners to meet and engage with the UN and the diplomatic and wider foreign affairs community in New York. The first events featured humanitarian coordinators for the Sahel and for Afghanistan. But we always intended to branch out and include practitioners from the wider world outside the UN, and this commemoration of the ICRC's 150 years is the perfect opportunity for us to do that. And finally, protection of civilians is a fit focus for a conversation here, since it comes up in so many contexts these days, ranging from peacekeeping mandates to an occasion just last week when Hilda Johnson, the special representative of the Secretary General for South Sudan, the UN's newest member state, spoke here in our SRSG series with all the possible subjects we could have taken up in talking about the difficult birthing of a brand new country. The one Hilda wanted to focus on was protection of civilians. <clears throat> we have a terrific panel here to discuss our subject led by an old friend of IPI and of mine, uh, Peter Maurer, whom we remember fondly from his service here as permanent representative of Switzerland to the UN, and who is now, of course, the president of the ICRC. He will be joined in this debate by Michael Keating, the senior advisor on the protection of civilians in the executive office of the Secretary General. Michael is also a senior consulting fellow at Chatham House, and incidentally, he was the humanitarian coordinator for Afghanistan, who I spoke about a moment ago as an early participant in our humanitarian series. Following them will be our third panelist, Elizabeth Ferris, who is co-director of the Brookings LSE Project on Internal Displacement and author of the book, The Politics of Protection, The Limits of Humanitarian Action. So it gives me great pleasure to do something we used to do with frequency here, and that is to turn this over to Peter Maurer. Peter, welcome back to IPI, and the floor is yours. Thanks a lot. Uh Thanks, Warren and uh, colleagues, for uh, being here today. It's a pleasure to, to be back in New York uh, with a new hat and a new function and uh, some recent experiences also in this, uh, in this new function. What I think uh, I should do at the beginning is maybe uh, because of the burden of 150 years, uh, get rid of some of this burden and say a few things on what we learned, how we see it, challenges, what kind of principles ICRC developed through the history and which are topical to the, the issue of protection, and then say uh, another few things on, uh, on protection of civilians and, uh, and, and on possible interaction and distinction between the Red Cross and the Red Crescent movement, in particular ICRC's mandate and the UN. In terms of, uh, uh, of lessons from the past, I mean, ICRC's history has seen engagements in many conflicts, and through those engagement and critical dilemmas we were confronted, we, we have elaborated and, uh, some, some principles and, and modus operandi which characterize ICRC's work in, in today's conflict. To engage in a neutral manner with all arms bearers is important to us. To maintain an impartial approach to, its, uh, to assistance and to remain as close as possible to victims. Uh, we are very much bottom-up and victims-oriented and not conceptual uh, top-down-oriented. 
We have developed our very specific security protocols and are different from the UN system in not uh, relying on any military protection in our humanitarian work, but uh, run away from, from military protection in our operations. Uh, we have uh, learned to flexibly adapt our programs to con concrete situations and to do what we call contextual response. Uh, not one fits it all, but uh, be flexible in each and every context to define the program which is best addressing some of the needs. Uh, and we have developed over the years uh, policy and legal frameworks uh, which support uh, our activities uh, our activities in the field secondly it goes without saying that we uh, uh, we are as many in this room reading present day conflicts and trying to figure out where are we heading to and what are the some of the critical challenges with which we are confronted uh, I mean, there were hundreds to mention, but just a few which are mind-bogging in our day-to-day -day work and which are preoccupying us. It's definitely what we witness in many conflict, uh, the, the enormous fragmentation of armed groups, complicating negotiations of access and also complicating protection work, the development of new weapons, uh, the, the, uh, including robotics and, and uh, distant uh, weapons, which uh, brings a distance between the targeting officer, uh, the target, and uh, 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 in the battlefield. We see new types of internal conflicts where crime and conflict, as we understood it in the past, <clears throat> are intertwining in a different way than we were used to. Uh, it's not anymore the sort of liberation war of the 60s and 70s. We are confronted with, with new types of war. I just come back from Colombia, where, uh, for instance, the death toll and victims toll from the traditional conflict between the government and the FARC is only one-fourth of the overall death toll from conflict, while the big amount of victims from conflict, uh, from, from the narco violence, which is uh, 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 a big struggle in the country, are 75% are of the victims come from narco violence and not from traditional violence. So we are confronted with, with new theaters of conflict. And of course, we, uh, uh, we also uh, know that we are confronted with a changing environment in the humanitarian landscape because we are by far not the only or the biggest humanitarian actors in many conflicts, but other, others are there, and therefore in each and every situation of conflict, we are always uh, 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 compelled to define exactly who are those uh, most like-minded with whom we want uh, most likely to cooperate, what is the surface of cooperation, how much do we want to remain distinct, and where do, do we want uh, to define uh, cooperation schemes with others. And, and then finally, uh, just to, on, on these uh, general ramifications, it goes without saying that uh, we, as many other actors in the field, are confronted with important dilemmas uh, which all tie in into protection work and, and which uh, preoccupy us not only concretely in the field but also conceptually. How do we manage the intertwining of human rights and international humanitarian law one much more aspirational, the other always looking to the balance between military necessity and protection uh, components. Uh, the two systems are intertwined in the concrete reality of the ground, so how do we cope, the, 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 for, for instance, this dilemma? How do we cope with the dilemma that uh, we, we have seen emerging as a big discussion on Syria, where we have 
the traditional mandates and doctrines and documents and founding documents of humanitarian action, which all define humanitarian actors as in support of states, the Geneva Conventions 46, 182, and, and, and all the litany of resolutions and documents defining humanitarian action always puts the nation state as a, as a first responder. While problems often are transborder or even more than transborder are may have regional impacts. And so how do we navigate uh, the fact that uh, the reality of problems which come to us does not necessarily conform with with the books and mandates and uh, uh, and devices which we are encountering. So uh, many of these dilemmas I could uh, continue, but just to to give you a sort of a in in a first point uh, a, a sort of a broad picture on how we read the situation, what we learned from the past, what kind of principles we devise, and what kind of environment we are finding ourselves. The issue of protection of civilians encapsulates many of these paradoxes and of humanitarian action. And as a policy issue, it has been high on the international agenda. Uh, we have made a lot of progress on protection of civilians. Uh, many policy statements and resolutions talk about, uh, the, the, uh, about protection of civilians. You know them as good as, as I do. And uh, I think, sadly enough, these fine words have... Uh, and good intentions are rarely matched by the reality on the ground. The fundamental reason for this is perhaps uh, because uh, uh, it, because on the ground or those who devise those documents, uh, I should say, are not really uh, tied into interacting with the perpetrators and actors uh, on the ground. And there is uh, this huge gap between the decision-making organs on the one side and, uh, and the realities on the ground. And, and ICRC, of course, uh, feels a little bit uh, those tensions because our approach is first and foremost uh, to work with situations on the ground. What does protection for us mean? Huh? It means uh, first and foremost ensuring respect for IHL in situations of armed conflict, uh, which is at the heart of our mandate and mission. And this reflects in how we aim to protect and assist the victims of armed conflict. Indeed, for the ICRC, protection and assistance go ha hand in hand. We do not separate really uh, conceptually in, in a fine way assistance and protection work. Our operational presence is huge in hugely diversified situations of armed conflict and other situations of violence has always protection and assistance component. We engage in confidential dialogue with state and non-state actors to uphold the rights of those victims aiming as much as possible to prevent violations from occurring in the first place. Such dialogue is facilitated to a large degree by strict adherence to principles approach, but we remind the parties of their obligations to protect civilians and we promote compliance with IHL at all levels. This includes supporting authorities to incorporate IHL in national leg legislation, into army trainings manuals, uh, in into curricula, and this also includes work to clarify, develop certain aspects of IHL and of protection work. So this is the sort of work we do on the ground and it is uh, always accompanied, or most of the time, it is uh, accompanied by uh, uh, by addressing victims' needs, be they food, water, shelter, other essential items of medical care, and so we we really try to link protection and uh, and uh, uh, assistant work at the ground. Of course, ICRC's approach is only one of many, but. Uh, it, it explains probably because 
If we look at the UN protection activities in the mandates of peacekeeping operations and improving protection for specific group as women, children, refugees, IDPs, has advanced a lot in terms of Security Council resolutions, doctrines, and, uh, and here again, of course, has uh, the, the huge challenge to, the, to bring the aspirations of all those words and resolutions uh, to the ground. True consensus on these rather bottom-up and top-down uh, perspectives on pro protection is, is, of course, hugely hugely difficult. It's, it's two uh, very different perspectives. Uh, one of our worries when we look at uh, uh, the UN protection agendas and, for instance, the platform uh, of the protection of civilians is that uh, the, rec we, we, the ICRC recognizes the, the importance of the efforts uh, to protection of civilians. But we see also that in the political fora, we see often that it comes at the cost of some confusion on what is neutral, impartial character of principled humanitarian action. By definition, it comes with a political agenda. So when you talk about protection in Syria, uh, it normally comes with a heavy political agenda. And, and it's a different way of uh, of talking and, and defining protection work than w w when you do it needs-based and bottom-up uh, uh, from the ground. Too often strategies for the protection of civilians developed in multilateral humanitarian fora come with no concrete instruments or clear met methods to apply. This is something which, uh, which of course, uh, on peacekeeping, it has been improving over the past years, but, but still, uh, you, you have a lot of, of policy statements with no clear operational definition on how uh, these statements uh, how these statements are followed up. Uh, so I would say protection of civilians definitely needs greater clarity on the means and, and methods in particular to ensure plausible, plausible impact. Uh, Impact, impact on the ground. So when I when we talk about distinction and uh, and complementarity, uh, I would very much feel that uh, our distinction at ICRC is the bottom up methods building on needs and trying to bring protection conceptual protection work together with assistant work, while we we see the huge advantage of the conceptual work done in, in the Security Council and in UN operations where at the same time we feel that some links with implementation protocols and concrete uh, action on the ground is missing. So I came here uh, not least because Michael has all the answers uh, to that problem <laughs> and uh, because I wanted to build up the tension uh, of this unresolved question because I understand that Michael knows it all and that he finds the solutions to the questions I put forward. Thanks a lot. Um, uh, as before, Peter Maurer has rendered me utterly useless here. I was about to call on Michael Keating, but Peter has already done it and has even prepared the linkage. So I will just hand it over to you, Michael. Well, I, I thought you, your, your, your colleagues briefed you well, but clearly uh, that's no longer the case. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me begin uh, first by uh, congratulating ICRC on this venerable uh, milestone, 150 years, and congratulate you, Peter. I, I, I can't think of, you know, a, a more political advocate for the humanitarian cause, and I think that's for the unpolitical. So I, I think it's a wonderful uh, combination, and uh, uh, I, I, I think it's it's fantastic that it's in, in its wisdom that the committee has asked you to take on this responsibility. So that's. Truly wonderful, and uh, I, I'm here as much uh, to learn as to to impart. And I certainly do not have all the answers. In fact, I'm thoroughly confused at the moment because I'm in the middle of an assignment, halfway through an assignment, uh, on behalf of the Deputy Secretary General, 
working with colleagues in the UN system uh, to look at how the UN can strengthen uh, its uh, capacity uh, to uh, protect civilians, to protect the human rights of civilians in crisis uh, situations. And this uh, assignment has been triggered by the report uh, that came out, uh, was produced by an internal review panel following the Sri Lanka experience in 2009. And Jeremy was just saying, you know, perhaps the most useful thing I can do in this discussion is tell you a little bit about how we're going about that work rather than offer you any, uh, you know, solutions to resolving all the many dilemmas. But I can't, I must say that I think many of the dilemmas that keep cropping up, some of them are not, you know, a, as serious as, a, as, as, as sometimes, uh, you know, one thinks, you know, one, one dilemma that people have, have, have often raised with us is, well, what's the difference between protection of civilians and protection of human rights? And I think if you take it from a field perspective, a lot of these dilemmas melt away. I mean, you, you need to use all the tools available to you to protect people in crisis and in conflict situations. And some of them relate more to the humanitarian toolbox and some of them relate more to the human rights toolbox. I think another dilemma that's constantly raised is between confidentiality and advocacy and, and so on. And again, I don't think that's necessarily a dilemma uh, and so on. So, you know, I think if one of the things that we can do is debunk some of the dilemmas with a view to strengthening uh, the partnerships that are possible on the ground to provide practical support, uh, you know, to, pro to provide practical protection to civilians, that's something that we should aim for. But the assignment um, I've been asked to undertake as head of this uh, secretariat uh, takes as its starting point the uh, report on Sri Lanka. Uh, and the objective is to produce a, an implementable action plan uh, that will be reviewed first by the Deputy Secretary General and then, if he likes it, uh, by the Secretary General. Uh, on you know, concrete things that can be done to improve the UN's practical capacity in the area of protection. And for me, it's, a, it's an enormous privilege being asked to do this because you know, I've spent most of my UN career in the field. I've spent very little time in New York. And uh, I feel I'm the kind of, you know, the, the, the country bumpkin who's been invited up to town to meet uh, everybody who's important. <laughs> to discuss things and see things from the perspective uh, of the field. Uh, and uh, I think we're approaching it, well, uh, we are approaching it in four ways. And, and, and there are traces of the Sri Lanka uh, report in this. First is, is, is to look at ways in which uh, the UN can re-energize its own vision regarding protection of civilians, regarding uh, implementation, uh, as it were, of, of uh, operational implementation of protection and promotion of human rights. What does this actually mean? And one of the most uh, encouraging things that, 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 that I've experienced in talking to people is the number who have said to me, listen, I joined the UN because of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I joined the UN because I believe in the Charter. And, you know, sometimes we forget that. And one of the questions is, to what degree are, uh, are we, you know, is, it, is that part of our DNA being given as much attention uh, as it needs to? Uh, and how can that vision be renewed, whether from the top or in other ways, including through things like human resource management and um, recognition and sanctions and all the rest of it? The second area is how better to engage with member states. I mean, after all, the UN is an organization of member states. The member states, Switzerland would know this, presumably have to agree to the rules of membership when they become members. And one of the rules, uh, you know, relates to, the, I mean, it's the Charter and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and other bodies of law, notably refugee law and so on. And what do you do when one of the members, uh, uh, you know, goes uh, badly off script and, and drives a cart and horse uh, through the rule book? Uh, you know, to what degree is it left to the club 
secretary to deal with this, and to what degree is it actually in the interests of the other members of the club uh, to reaffirm the rules, uh, and to what degree is the UN uh, as creative, as assertive, as deliberate as it could be in making sure uh, that, uh, as it were, uh, its engagement with member states is oriented uh, you know, very firmly towards the protection uh, of civilians uh, and the pr uh, protection and promotion of human rights. The third area is how to strengthen the UN's uh, crisis management, leadership and coordination. And again, as so often in the UN system, there are so many examples of truly excellent leadership and coordination. But unfortunately, these examples of excellent leadership coordination and management often serve to highlight the many examples where the opposite is the case. And the question becomes, is it possible to systematize uh, you know, best practice and good precedent so that there is a more consistent approach uh, to providing leadership in crisis situations? And the fourth area is how to support and strengthen uh, colleagues in the field um, you know, who are dealing with crisis and, and pre-crisis uh, situations. Uh, you know, I, I, I was most recently in, in, in Afghanistan, which of course is one of the biggest, if not the biggest, political mission, uh, UN political mission in the world, and we had a big human rights office. Uh, but often these situations arise where there is no mission, and this poses real challenges for the guys on the ground. Uh, there isn't necessarily a strong, uh, you know, uh, human rights uh, presence. Uh, there may be not that strong a humanitarian presence. And the, the, the teams there are faced with enormous dilemmas. And often they have been, you know, as you know, um, uh, appointed uh, on the basis of the country's socioeconomic needs rather than its uh, political or other dilemmas. Uh, and and, and this, 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 this poses a number of, of, of basic challenges. So uh, we're in the process of, of talking to as many people as we can, both within the system. We're now engaging with member states. I've met with some of your colleagues, Peter, in uh, Geneva, reaching out to the human rights community, uh, very much with a view, though, to strengthening the UN's own capacity. And tomorrow we'll have uh, the members of the working group to whom I'm answerable in the UN system. There'll be a retreat in which we, we thrash through some of these issues, and I hope we're going to come up with some very practical implementation, implementable ideas that we can put to the DSG and the, SR, uh, the SG uh, in this area. But there's a number of things that, just three or four things that are jumping out at me. And with apologies to those of you, I see a couple of you from that working group in the room. So, you know, I don't want to preempt what we come up with tomorrow, but, uh, you know, I'm about to do exactly that. Uh, <laughs> So the first thing that strikes me is the need for protection strategies. And it's, it's amazing. I mean, I've spoken to lots of RCs and HCs in the last couple of uh, uh, days and weeks, and, and they don't often have them. Or not, that's wrong. They often don't have them. Some of them simply don't have them. And I think the very issue of having a protection strategy for a specific situation is crucial. And that is where I think ICRC is very much, much further ahead than the UN on this. I mean, you're much more systematic. I think you've got a number of things that make it easier for ICRC to be more systematic than the UN. But the UN you know, has had some wonderful protection strategies in a number of situations, but it is not systematic. But we need those uh, protection strategies. And they include everything from how do you engage with authorities, how do you use information, how do you manage information, how do you engage with member states, how do you leverage different parts of the UN system when things start going wrong. Uh, I think a second area we need, as I've mentioned, much uh, clearer crisis management mechanisms, both on the ground and at headquarters. Uh, and as I say, that's particularly important in situations where there is no political mission. For those of you who have read the internal review panel report on Sri Lanka, this was one of the most dramatic uh, insights that the guys on the ground you know, were very confused as to whom they were supposed to be relating to uh, at headquarters. Uh, the third thing is uh, that we need to um, uh, engage with member states in a way that reinforces their own responsibilities 
uh, to protect civilians. Again, Peter, you've alluded to this, and this does raise a number of dilemmas. Mm -hmm. But I think this is where the strategy comes in. A strategy has to come to terms with that dilemma and figure out how do you deal with it? At what point does your responsibility to support authorities, local or national or military, to fulfill their obligations get displaced by a higher responsibility, which is, you know, to ensure that the uh, that, that, that protection is actually taking place. And how do you manage that dilemma? And how, again, do you use different parts of the system to communicate different messages and maintain different activities at the same time? Uh, and then the final thing is the importance of personal leadership and, and courage. Uh, time and time again, uh, there are examples of individuals, whether in the UN system, I imagine ICRC, in the NGO community, everywhere, where personal leadership and courage is dramatically decisive uh, in making a difference. And you cannot manufacture courage, I don't think. But what you can do is nurture it, recognize it, reward it. You can, much more difficult, also go into the area of recognizing uh, a failure of courage and at least not reward those who distinguish themselves by failing to take responsible uh, risks when, when they're required. So, you know, I, I, I do apologize, Peter. I haven't answered uh, uh, all your questions, but I just thought I would share with you some of the things that we're thinking about and maybe in the discussion come back to, to, to talk about some of the dilemmas that this, uh, that this raises. Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, we'll now turn to Beth Ferris, who is the senior fellow and co-director of the Brookings LSE Project on Internal Displacement, and also authored the book, The Politics of Protection, The Limits of Humanitarian Action. Beth? Thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to say happy birthday to ICRC. 150 years is a monumental achievement. And far more than the years that you've been around has been the inspiration that you've given to so many of us in the humanitarian community. I think we all have an interest, whether states or UN agencies or NGOs or others, in maintaining ICRC's unique role. I mean, Peter mentioned the importance of complementary roles, but I ICRC does things and can live out the humanitarian principles in ways that few other actors can, and that's something that deserves protection for the next century and a half as we face new humanitarian challenges. What I'd like to do is throw out, like my predecessors, uh, several questions, not directed specifically to ICRC, but indeed to the um, humanitarian community in general. I think of these as uncomfortable or pesky questions because they don't have easy answers and yet I think are really central as we look at the state of protection of civilians in the world today. First is a um, you know, somewhat difficult question of how you define protection. Now, discussions about definitions are offering often boring, they can last forever, you can go round and round, and yet I think that the way in which the humanitarian community has defined protection leads to lots of problems. The general consensus is that protection is all activities that aimed at obtaining full respect for the rights of the individual. Think about that for a minute. Full respect all rights of the individual. Protection and assistance are clearly related, but is all assistance protection? Is every educational program, health program, income generation program protection? Are we perhaps fooling ourselves when we call all of that protection? Yes, of course, disease kills children just as much as bullets do, often more. And yet somehow the notion that protection has expanded to include all of humanitarian action, I think does us a disservice. When my husband and I lived in Geneva, we had good friends who had a 16-year-old going through a difficult time. The, the young man was into drugs and alcohol and stealing money and skipping school. And I remember saying to the mother, how do you stand it? And she said, our goal is to keep him alive. If he can survive these years, we can fix everything else. We can fix school or bad grades or even a police wreck, but if he doesn't survive, we can't fix it. To me, when I think of protection, there is something qualitatively different about keeping people alive 
physical security, by calling so many of our programs protection, good programs, but by calling so many of our programs protections, per perhaps we've expanded the concept too much. A second question is who protects people? Can anybody do protection? If you think of protection in terms of physical security, military police forces have a different role than the Oxfam's or Save the Children's or UNICEF's in terms of providing protection to people. Sometimes those of us in the shall I say, non-ICRC humanitarian community are reluctant to engage with police and military. There's almost a sense that if we talk to them, we might be kind of corrupted. And yet, in order to provide this protection, I think we need to learn from some of ICRC's um, experiences in working with military and um, police forces. A third question, which both of the previous speakers have mentioned, is the question of where, oh, where are the governments? When I read the report of the internal panel on Sri Lanka, my first thought is, why, why is all the blame going to UN agencies? What about the government? Isn't the government fundamentally responsible for protecting people living within its territory? As humanitarians running protection programs, are we letting governments off the hook by substituting for them, by doing things? and calling them protection, the responsibility of governments may be, um, may be diminished. We may also be creating expectations. I remember walking through a Haitian IDP camp uh, after the earthquake with an NGO to look at the protection program, but that NGO wasn't there at night. Nobody was there at night except for the IDPs. To what extent is calling a program our protection program, creating expectations on the part of affected communities that these guys are going to keep us safe? A fourth question, quite uncomfortable one, is how do we as humanitarian actors deal with endemic protection problems? Again, to use the example of Haiti, I talked to a number of um, humanitarian agencies and I would say, what are you doing about sexual and gender-based violence? And with different variations, the same message came across. There's always been sexual gender-based violence in Haiti. There always will be long after we're gone. It's not our problem. Well, when you have situations, and not just sexual and gender-based violence, but discrimination against ethnic or religious minorities or child trafficking, things that have existed before the humanitarian crises and may exist after, to what extent do humanitarian actors have a responsibility to address those issues? Do we expect humanitarians to address all the ills of society? or just to provide immediate life-saving assistance and not deal with those underlying issues. This also raises the question of what, what are the legitimate areas for humanitarian action? Attacks by non-state actors, clearly violations of international humanitarian law, need for humanitarian engagement is clear. But domestic violence when women are beaten? Not an issue necessarily for humanitarians. HIV AIDS, not necessarily a humanitarian issue. Who is defining what is the scope of humanitarian action and what are broader societal issues that others should be dealing with? And finally, a question that I think is going to confront us all in the humanitarian world more and more. In a world of drones and robots and cyber wars, what does protection mean? Who does protection? Who's monitoring it? ICRC, I know, is working very hard to look at international humanitarian law in light of some of these new technological developments. But, but I fear that ICRC processes aren't going to move fast enough. These developments are happening quickly, now, widespread. The, the pace of technological change seems to be much faster than the pace of our international legal experts to figure out what this is going to mean. And in the absence of guidance from organizations like ICRC and international legal experts, it could be up to those who are making the technologies and using the technologies to figure out the rules of the game. So these are just five questions that I don't expect you all to answer, but I think that they will stay with us in the humanitarian community for some time.
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Beth. Uh, we're going to turn to the floor in a moment. I have a question of my own for each of the three panelists, and let me start with Peter in the order in which they spoke. Um, Peter, a lot of the comments from all three of you have had to do with definition, with clarity. Um, and I wanted to ask you about the international humanitarian law. Uh, the ICRC is often thought of as the guardian of that law. And you spoke yourself about the different kinds of conflict you confront now, difficulties of access, um, modernity and technology, and all the challenges that poses. Is the IHL still the, the relevant document? Is it, or does it have to be adapted to suit all these new conditions that you mentioned? Well, I, I think there are a lot of situations in which, which we are encountering with, which are completely in sync with the normative framework to which we are relating to. I mean, uh, uh, civilians are targeted today as they have been 50 years, 100 years, and 150 years ago, and you need to have procedures of distinguishing military objectives from civilian objectives, and there is no fundamental change as such in the value, in, in the normative systems. Uh, <clears throat> also, uh, uh, if you look, uh, uh, medical facilities and medical doctors and nurses need protection in each and every conflict, and this is again true today as it has been in, in the past. So I could go on to say there is a huge body uh, of norms and, and definitions which, have, which we are carrying along which are highly topical to what we encounter, and we can easily relate it to realities. And, and, and the crucial question is, as ICRC has consistently said, to have these rules apply. But I would be the first one to recognize as well that we are confronted with realities which you do not easily adequate to the normative framework we have. Beth has just mentioned uh, the, the slow pace of legal expertise dealing with drones, robotic, cyber war, and others. Uh, so this is, this is definitely uh, our areas where IHL is, has not just the quick answer uh, to, to all the questions and needs development, uh, leaving now open on what kind of format such developments at the end of the day should take. But it only makes sense at the end of the day if broad consensus between the stakeholders, meaning states, are sharing either interpretations, norms, which you develop in, a, in order to address new situations. Uh, IHL doesn't make sense if you have 15 like-minded saying that uh, this or that is incompatible with uh, humanitarian law. You need broader, broader context, and that's the reason why at the present moment, we do work mandated by the Red Cross and Red Crescent Conference, for instance, <clears throat> on mechanisms of application of international humanitarian law, as well as norms on, uh, on detention in non-international armed conflict. These are just two examples where obviously the normative framework has been by consensus considered not sufficient and where we have mandates to work upon on others. Uh, it's our leadership that is asked in order to, to feed the academic and policy debate with uh, analysis uh, that we make. But uh, I would certainly caution to just because of new realities, just to uh, quickly disregard the legal framework. I think the most of the legal framework roots in customary law and thus is, is still a body of norms and values which is very topical, very accurate uh, in dealing with the present situation. Uh, thank you. Uh, Michael, one of the f five key challenges 
to protect civilians described in recent reports of the Secretary General on the protection of civilians is to ensure compliance with international law by non-state armed groups. Yet there's also a growing counterterrorism legislation that criminalizes contacts with non-state armed groups, uh, calling them terrorists. Um, I want to ask you, is this criminalization of humanitarian engagement with non-state armed groups a real concern for humanitarian agencies? Is this one of the many, many questions you're dealing with in your office? Um, I mean, I think it clearly is a, uh, a major concern. Um, uh, and it is not something that is central to the uh, assignment uh, uh, I have at the moment, or hasn't hasn't yet sort of cropped up as one of the big issues that we're we're we're, we're addressing. But it does remind me of uh, the situation uh, in Afghanistan, uh, where I was located until uh, November, uh, and <clears throat> you know uh, prompts me to spiral back to the. the point about the value of thinking strategically if your intention is to protect civilians. Uh, in the case of uh, Afghanistan, clearly one of the major challenges was the behavior of the warring uh, parties. Uh, and while the government and the ISAF uh, clearly, uh, you know, have a body of law which we can all recognize to which uh, they adhere and which gives you a basis for accountability and advocacy and all the rest of it. Uh, it was much, much more difficult uh, in terms of dealing with the, the Taliban and, and all the various other groups. And uh, that prompted some, uh, I, mean, I know ICRC did some fairly extraordinary, or is still doing some fairly extraordinary things, but for the UN, you know, what we were doing was um, looking at absolutely every public statement they were making, using every opportunity we had to understand their code of conduct, to understand the orders that they were providing to their own uh, fighters, and then challenging them, uh, both through uh, the public domain uh, and through the production of reports on uh, civilian casualties, on uh, treatment of detainees, on harmful traditional practices, on violence against women, and getting these reports translated into languages and launched in places and with people whereby we knew that they would definitely get the attention of the uh, warring parties, including those uh, who are non-state actors, and engage them on that basis. And with, actually, to the degree that, you know, uh, dialogue between, uh, on, 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 on protection of civilians is one indicator, the volume of dialogue is an indicator of effectiveness of engagement, it was quite successful. You know, um, you know, major uh, reactions every time the UN issued a civilian casualty report from the Taliban denouncing this and denouncing that and clearly taking it very seriously because, you know, along with other actors in Afghanistan, uh, we were reaching out uh, uh, and talking to the people who, maybe not talking directly, but certainly talking to the people who influence those who are per perpetrating uh, these actions. So it is a, a very serious dilemma, uh, but it doesn't mean even when some of these armed groups are prescribed internationally, it does not mean that you cannot find ways of engaging with them, including on their own terms and trying to influence their behavior using their own uh, values sometimes uh, to protect civilians. It's actually not often the UN is given credit for something, but I think UNAMA is credited uh, with the extra precautionary measures that uh, forces took, took on both sides uh, because of all those warnings and uh, you issued at the time. Um, Beth, um, uh, I want to ask you about something that actually came up in this room yesterday, and that is uh, the tension between humanitarian action and the need for justice and accountability. Yesterday, we had a session here on the recent elections in Kenya. So the whole question of what will happen if Uhuru Kenyatta is declared the winner, a man who has been charged by the ICC with crimes against humanity. And of course, the more obvious one was the indictment of Sudan's President Omar al-Bashir uh, that directly led to the eviction of 16 major NGOs who were also working on protection issues. Uh, do you hear a question in that? Um, 
Uh, is that one of the things that we're facing now that we would not have had to face about five years ago? Definitely. I think that there's a real tension, particularly between organizations trying to live by humanitarian principles of neutrality and independence to then be faced with the reality of wanting to see perpetrators brought to justice. I think many humanitarians stay away from that process because by contributing to um, International Criminal Court or other transitional justice mechanisms, there's a perception that you're taking sides. You're providing evidence to one side or another. And by doing so, you may compromise your ability to work in humanitarian settings. You won't be seen as impartial or as independent or as neutral. Even though I'm pretty sure that most humanitarians, even when they don't participate in those kinds of evidence collecting initiatives, secretly hope that those who have caused the violence, when they're seeing people who have been victims of that violence, they're hoping for a justice process by somebody else that will hold this uh, leaders accountable for the things they've done. I might just comment on the previous question on the non-state armed actors question. I suspect that most humanitarian actors, not just ICRC, have sometimes made compromises by talking with a particular armed group in order to get delivery of humanitarian relief in. Sometimes those negotiations, ugly and unpleasant as they are, seem to be the only way to get access access to groups. MSF came out with a book a couple of years ago that detailed in amazing um, honesty some of the compromises that they'd made over the years in humanitarian assistance. And there have been other published records of those kinds of um, discussions that sometimes are needed in order to make sure that people don't die. Thank you. Now, I'd love to, if you would just raise your hand, I'll call on you. By the way, we are webcasting this, so when the microphone reaches you, and please don't speak until it does, uh, hold it very steady. And it would be sometimes helpful in a big crowd like this if you would stand up when you speak. So I'll take several questions at once here in the third. There, there's the second one, and do I have a thir and third one here in the front row? Okay, I'll stand up. I don't have to turn around to be visible to the webcast. Don't, ha so. don't have to, <laughs> but you do have to introduce yourself. Uh, Oliver Ulick from DPKO, thanks for, for those very interesting presentations and questions. Um, I wanted to make one additional quick comment on the very good presentation from, from Michael Keating, um, and we will be very much engaged in the Sri Lanka follow-on process as DPKO and tomorrow. Um, peacekeeping missions, all the ones that have protection of civilians mandates, um, have done a huge amount of work in developing their own protection strategies together with the rest of the country team and many other protection actors on the ground. They've been rolled out in most of our missions um, and 90% plus of our personnel on the ground are deployed in missions with protection of civilians mandates as most of, here, most of the people here probably know. We're trying to see how we can learn from that experience for the cases that we're primarily focusing on in the Sri Lanka follow-on discussions, which are non-mission countries where we don't have military um, or police personnel on the ground, often don't have a political mission, and often are not asked to play any kind of political role, which are the toughest cases, obviously, when, when we want to do something about protection in the political sense. Um, the question I had was for Peter Maurer, um, who very, I think, helpfully focused on um, some of the, the armed actors that are not combatants i.e. criminal gangs and networks that are causing a huge amount of the, 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 the deaths and violence in many of these countries, but also fueling the conflicts directly or indirectly. Humanitarians have handbooks um, galore about engaging combatant armed actors. Um, uh, to what extent is the ICRC, for example, looking at engaging criminal gangs and networks um, directly, I don't know whether you can and are planning to, um, based on your legal mandate. Um, I don't think the, the rest of the humanitarian community is doing much about that. And the UN, I think, to this day has not really ventured in that area at all. So that's-, that's Thank you. If you would group. pass the microphone to your right. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, thank you very much for a great presentation on this uh, uh, very important topics. Uh, my name is Taisaku Higashi. I'm a minister counselor in Japan's mission. And um, one of my responsibilities is to cover UN mediation effort in the world. So I'd like to ask a question about relationship between the like, political negotiation and uh, humanitarian assistance. Uh, as, uh, some people might argue that 
because the government and the level, like insurgency, it tend to agree on the humanitarian assistance. Uh, it could be good to utilize those agreement to advance kind of political process. For example, in Afghanistan, there have been truce between the government and the Taliban on the day of vaccination or polio vaccinations uh, for several years, as Michael know very well. And some people might argue that it could be used to increase the confidence buildings between the you know, level and the government. But at the same time, on the other hand, some people might argue that it's very dangerous to commingle or to combine the political agenda and the humanitarian agenda because it might endanger the humanitarian assistance. But other people might argue that in the end of the day, you need to make some you know, political process to make a peace. And without making a peace, it's very difficult to deliver the humanitarian assistance. So it might be a difficult question, but uh, I appreciate uh, your response. Thank you very much. Discussion. And I think my third question, there, oh, Jeremy. Um, Jeremy Labbe from uh, IPI. Uh, first, thanks to, to all panelists for outstanding uh, presentations and uh, for your reflections on, uh, on this difficult and uh, and very unfortunately, still very timely subject. We we'll just have to look to Syria to, to remember that uh, I mean, we're talking about uh, things that are happening there. Uh, my question is addressed first and foremost to, to Michael Keating, uh, and, and it's about the, the tensions that uh, some of you alluded to uh, between um, different priorities when we talk about protection of civilians. I mean, we're talking about uh, human rights, we're talking about humanitarian assistance, we're talking about uh, um, international criminal justice and the need for accountability. Uh, we're talking about context where um, um, a same organization can implement some development programs or rule of law um, and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, well, whereas an organization like the ACRC, which is uh, quite current and monolithic, if I, if I can say, uh, might have to, um, uh, to deal with those tensions between delivering assistance and uh, uh, speaking about the tough issues of, uh, of protection of civilians and violations of IHL, I, I see it even more difficult for the United Nations with the variety of agencies, of, uh, of activities, programs, objectives, institutional objectives. Um, and I think one of the conclusions of the, uh, or one of the recommendations of the Petra report on Sri Lanka was the need, you mentioned it, uh, Michael, to uh, uh, strengthen leadership in, uh, in the, the crisis management of those protection crisis. Uh, does it mean that, and, and w would it be acceptable that uh, some um, actors within the UN system, some agencies, might have to accept to uh, close the door in uh, in case uh, in a situation, say like uh, like uh, well in Sri Lanka, uh, it is decided by this enforced leadership um, to speak out, to denounce, to denounce what is going on. What about UNDP's programs in the country uh, and? So I guess it is very much part of the discussion, and do you think it is realistic to impose this kind of uh, strengthened, enforced leadership based on protection of civilians? Thank you. Excellent. Uh, Peter, if you could answer the question directed at you about the criminal organization. Well, thanks a lot. It's indeed a, a complicated, uh, complicated issue. But uh, to put complicated sim things simple, uh, ICRC basically tries to watch carefully on who is at the origin of uh, armed violence and the impact of armed violence on civilians. And when in terms of organizational degree and intensity of conflict, we come to the conclusion that this is armed conflict uh, either internal or international, we engage with those arms bearers who are at the origin of uh, of violence. So it's uh, we 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 do have the respective protocols. We do not distinguish between terrorists, narco violence, and uh, and liberation group. Our our categories are not. In, in those political areas. We look at the concrete impact of violence in a, in a concrete context, 
And if we come to the conclusion that in terms of intensity and organization, this is consistent with armed conflict, then we, we try to engage with those groups in order to talk international humanitarian law and the application of conduct of hostilities and, and, and others. And it, it's of course delicate because the, the, this way of procedures may not be uh, immediately agreed upon by the respective country. Uh, so there may be tensions and discussions and explanations necessary uh, when we do qualifications and engagements uh, in, on, on the way you asked the questions. With regard to the second question, which is also partly uh, addressed to, to ICRC, uh, I mean, we try to keep the agendas separate and the people separate, which means that we would hope at the end of the day that the best contribution of a humanitarian action to a peace building process is that when we are not engaging in the peace building process, but th that when we are engaging as neutral, impartial and independent humanitarian actors do the humanitarian work which may be a basis where people then can ease, more easily reconcile. But this would not necessarily be our business then to run reconciliation and, and, and peace process, but would be other organizations. And I think this ties into, into what, what we are discussing here at the end of the day, which is the sort of how far do you or how do you consider and define humanitarian action and protection and and michael you mentioned it probably one of the advantage of icrc or compared to the un or disadvantage at the same time is that we have a much more narrow interpretation on what we do under humanitarian action protection and what is humanitarian and and the, this is the disadvantage is of course you you reach less and your surface is is much more modest at the end of the day while when you when you have are more ambitions you try your humanitarian you tie humanitarian actions to other political agendas, be them human rights, development, and others, you get much broader operational surface to attend to some needs of people. While when you are much more limited, you get access to places where others cannot be active, but you are not as broad in covering some of the needs. Uh, Michael, Jeremy directed his question at you, so I think I'll ask you to answer it. Thanks for an easy question. Um, uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, just picking up on what Peter said, uh, I mean, I think one of the central dilemmas for the UN is it is a political organization. You know, it's an organization of member states that nevertheless has this you know, uh, human rights and humanitarian uh, role. And this just engenders dilemmas. And that's, I think, the biggest difference between the UN system and the Red Cross movement. I mean, uh, you know, it, we, we are an organization of member states. And what does that mean when it comes to humanitarian action? Uh, and what does it mean when it comes to protection of human rights? Uh, when the states are the principal... Uh, you know, the, the principal actors responsible for uh, protecting civilians. There's no question, Jeremy, that uh, it is more difficult for the UN, um, not least uh, as we're present. Uh, I know you are through the Red Cross movement and through various things, but we're, we're, we're present in pretty well every country in the world, including lots of so-called, you know, normal ones, let alone pre-crisis and, and crisis ones. Uh, I think this issue of, uh, and thank you, Oliver, for uh, you know emphasizing it, the, this business of uh, the particular problems that arise in uh, countries where there is no UN political or peacekeeping mission. 
And this puts where the situation changes very fast. You know, you have a country team and a resident coordinator typically appointed to support the government to achieve usually a bunch of, you know, essentially socioeconomic uh, objectives. Uh, and then find themselves uh, often in a rapidly deteriorating uh, environment, uh, and uh, you know uh, the, the this this raises a number of issues as to whether um, you know uh, how quickly you know what kind of skill sets are required uh, as these situations change, and does the system have sufficient flexibility to ensure that the people in positions of responsibility in the UN, including the RC herself or himself, uh, can be, uh, you know, changed uh, as circumstances require. I think that is uh, definitely uh, happening. Uh, it happened, uh, it's happened on a number of occasions in the last couple of years. Probably doesn't happen uh, often enough. Uh, whether the heads of the agencies, funds and programs represented in the country similarly uh, have the right skill sets uh, as these situations uh, change. Uh, but ultimately, um, you know, if the situation uh, does deteriorate very rapidly and it is impossible to have a political or peacekeeping mission for one reason or another, I think this is where the... Um, uh, you know, the <clears throat> the importance of leveraging, I mean, it sounds beautiful, but I think it actually means something as well. Leveraging the diversity of the UN system becomes very important. I mean, you have, you know, you have a whole regional layer of the UN that can be brought into play to support the country team. You have a whole layer at headquarters in Geneva and in New York that can be brought into play. And, you know, I, I would like to think that the dilemmas between maintaining access, uh, maintaining uh, private diplomacy, and pursuing public advocacy do not have to be as dramatically mutually exclusive as they often have been. But for, you to, for the system to be sophisticated enough to be able to pursue all these three things sim simultaneously, we need to be much more uh, systematic and much more strategic. I keep coming back to this, this idea of, of having you know, um, situation-specific, needs-driven str strategies. Uh, and I think this is something, and again, thank you, Oliver. I think you've, you've reprimanded me very diplomatically. Uh, you know, it is true that, uh, you know, DPKO has uh, dramatically up, up, upped, uh, upped its uh, uh, role in this area. But I, I, I don't know if you would agree with me that I think in many, you know, its success is highlighting the absence of these strategic approaches in many other places. And this is something that we absolutely have to have, whereby we're saying, you know, what are our objectives? What are our capacities? And who needs to do what? You cannot just dump everything on the shoulders of the resident coordinator. Uh, Beth, I'd welcome any comments you'd like to make. Yeah, two quick questions. I think often when the international community is unable to come up with a political solution, the answer seems to be humanitarian assistance, whether it's Syria or earlier in Bosnia. As, as Sadako Ogata, former UN High Commissioner, is attributed as saying, there are no humanitarian solutions to humanitarian crises. The solutions are all political. I mean, these are intertwined, and humanitarian aid doesn't substitute for the lack of political agreement. And the second point, I, I think also the Sri Lanka report makes clear, I think we need much more clarity on the complementary roles of advocacy, however that's defined. We don't expect ICRC to play the same role as Human Rights Watch in denouncing abuses, but we, we trust ICRC to carry out their quiet, behind closed doors diplomacy and recognize that's an important part of the system, even if you're not stridently denouncing when horrible things are happening. But I think we need to recognize it isn't just UN actors that are at risk. It's local organizations, local human rights and civil society organizations that speak out may pay a much higher price for denouncing the abuses that go on. And yet they, too, have important roles to play in some kind of a complementary strategic approach to advocacy. Uh, in the back room, please, and 
For the moment, that's the only question. Please. Uh, th thank you. I, I have a question. My name is Fabrizio Hochschild. Um, I now work for the UN department that supports field operations. But I'm on my way uh, to Colombia. And uh, thank you for your response, uh, Mr. Mara, to Oliver's question. Um, I guess my comment is this. Uh, there, there was much talk from the, 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 the panel about um, in the broader humanitarian community, the, the lack of definition and focus in, in uh, the use of the word protection. And then also um, a perception that in, while we've advanced a lot in the development of norms, the development of policies, the practical elaboration of those policies in ways which they can be easily um, implemented is still lacking and hasn't, hasn't kept pace. And that's contributed mm. to this protection gap uh, on the ground between the aspirations of the international community and the realities we face in many conflicts. I think that's very, very true, but I wonder if it's not just part of, of, of the story. Uh, coming back to what Beth said, surely um, the situation in the worst situation, Sri Lanka uh, at the height of, of the war, Syria, um, and, and other major conflicts, surely the truth in many of those situations is that what we have in our protection toolbox, our humanitarian protection toolbox, be it in the ICRC protection toolbox or in the toolbox of the broader humanitarian community, is hopelessly inadequate. And we need perhaps to be a little bit more forthright about um, acknowledging that you know, protection, humanitarian protection can be something of a false promise or at least an inadequate promise in some of these extreme situations. And as Beth indicated, quoting uh, Madame Ogata, you know, the, 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 in, in situations where there is major, major threat to the protection of, of individuals, the, the solution is very seldom a humanitarian protection response. It's almost always something different um, and something uh, uh, larger. Oh, in the back, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Marwan Jilani, IFRC, thanks, thanks for yeah. everybody. It's a great Hold it a little, little higher, if you will. A little, I thought it was too close, okay. Uh, my question relates to the reference to the local actors, the national actors. Also, what the president of ICRC, Mr. Maurer, has uh, emphasized that ICRC works uh, bottom up. And with the assertion of the role of national and local actors more and more, as we see these days, uh, the question is for Mr. Maurer. How do you see the relationship between ICRC and the national societies, Red Cross, Red Crescent? has evolved in the past? And how you, do you see the role of national societies uh, is evolving even in conflict situation and in, in internal conflict situations? Thanks. Thank you. Okay, Peter, would you take those two questions? Uh, j just to the fir uh, first one, uh, I think we, we all agree who have been working in this area that there, there is always, at the end of the day, limits to to what we we are able to do and what we are doing, and limits to the tools we have, and and those limits are are pretty serious and are uh, bringing us in, in each critical situation also to tr to address ourselves to the real stakeholders of power in order f for 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 more serious and uh, remedy than what we can do. Having said that, I think what we can do as humanitarians is nevertheless considerable, and Michael has alluded to some of it, and Beth as well, in terms of uh, defining strategies which are adequate to needs on the ground in order to improve professionalism of the humanitarian community and leadership in terms of dealing with those difficult situations. So recognizing that at the end of the day, the most critical ones we may not be able to confront, there is still a lot that we can still improve in, in those areas where we are able to act and which are in our power. So when I alluded to 
some of the gaps, it was not because I wanted just to to send the ticket to the Security Council, the ticket of responsibility to the Security Council, but rather to encourage all of us to think what are pragmatic uh, improvements. And then I would agree with you, we have to be extremely modest that there are limits afterwards uh, of, uh, of what we can do, even if we are very good and, uh, and very determined to improve our capacities to act. Uh, with regard to to national societies and I mean the, the the critical issues that you raise Marwan is the relationship between ICRC with the Geneva Convention based mandate for armed conflict and the activities of national societies which are at the same time subsidiaries and has have subsidiary functions in, in many countries, and some of them quite explicit uh, with regard to the government. So in internal conflict, this raises tensions because national societies on the one side are our partners in delivering aid, and at the same time are subsidiary organs of the, of the government which is involved in conflict. Syria is, is the typical example. And, and because the, the example is typical, there is no typical answer. Uh, meaning that I think we are far away today. Uh, I mean, beyond just general commitments to want to, uh, of willingness and wish to, to work together with local actors, including national societies, but we are far away to have a model on how to do it in conflict because each and every conflict has different dynamics. But I can explain you, uh, and, and to the room here with regard to Syria, because this is something everybody is interested, that the, the sort of partnership between ICRC and the Syrian Arab Red Crescent over more than two years in conflict now has definitely changed the way ICRC looks at certain things, but has certainly changed the, op the modus operandi of the Syrian Arab Red Crescent. It's, it's an accompanying process in which, of course, we insisted a lot of principled humanitarian action. And through the concrete engagement with the Syrian Arab Red Crescent, you get increasingly better results in terms of impartial, independent humanitarian action. No guarantee that each and every place is to, perfect, to perfection immediately. There are, uh, there are places where we, we don't have the same understandings. But the, the very point is that in order to move things, you have to engage. And, and I think uh, there is a, a, a strong recognition at ICRC that we need to engage even if this is difficult in, and we need to engage even in conflicts with the, national, with the national societies and even if the national societies may be also part of the problem, but they are certainly part of the solution. And, and therefore uh, need our uh, our engagement. But uh, I can't you model through some vision where I would say this is now the model for other parts uh, of the world uh, as well. But in the three key con sort of in in the three key theaters of conflict where. Uh, I have visited last, uh, lately the national society in each of them in Afghanistan, in Mali and in Syria has been under enormous pressure uh, of the government, of outside actors, of the UN, of the whole system wanting to use them and at the same time of, the, uh, of their respective governments and parties to conflict and nevertheless maintained a unity within the country which works, which is operational and which brings aid to people. And so we, uh, I think this is a, 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 a couple of good examples just to show you in which direction uh, we would imagine uh, strong cooperation with national societies even in conflict. My 
fellow panelists are in agreement with me that Peter Maurer should have the last word. Uh, so I'm happy that it ended with that. And that was such a, a full response to that uh, it's a nice way to wrap it up. I want to join them in, in saying happy birthday to Peter, uh, saying how great it is to have you back here, and saying um, how good you look for somebody celebrating his 150th year. <laughs>